This is a picture test in practical neuroanatomy. You may use the video as a revision for the topic or as a self-assessment tool. For the purpose of self-assessment, you may pause the video and spend your own time to read the question and come up with the answer, then replay the video to confirm your answer by listening to the comments and explanations. Now I will deal with the sectional anatomy of the brain. What is the nerve supply of the extraocular muscle shown to be pushed by the cyst? Which part of the brainstem is shown in this MRI? This is an axial MRI showing an intraorbital dermoid cyst on the left side. The cyst is pushing the lateral rectus muscle, which is supplied by the abducent nerve. This is the only muscle supplied by the abducent nerve. Opposite to the lateral rectus, you can see the medial rectus muscle. Note that the muscles are attached to the eyeball, hence they can move the eyeball. In the middle of the section, you can see the pons. Note the basilar part of the pons and the tegmentum. This is the upper part of the pons, in which the fourth ventricle becomes narrower to continue up as the cerebral aqueduct. Note the basilar artery in front of the pons, in the midline. Match the numbered structures in the transverse section with the lettered structures in the coronal section. One in the horizontal section is the longitudinal fissure, the deep groove that separates the two cerebral hemispheres. It also extends posteriorly here. It matches with N in the coronal section, in which corpus callosum is shown to cross between the two hemispheres at the bottom of the longitudinal fissure. Two is the third ventricle. It is the midline cavity between the two thalami, so it matches with H in the coronal section. Five is the thalamus, which borders the third ventricle and thus matches with G in the coronal section. Six is the posterior limb of the internal capsule. This is located between the thalamus and the globus pallidus, seven. So six matches with F, which lies between the thalamus G and globus pallidus E. Seven, the globus pallidus, the pale medial part of the lentiform nucleus, matches with E, as I just mentioned. Eight is the putamen, the lateral part of the lentiform nucleus, which matches with D. Three is the clostrum, a thin layer of neurons located lateral to the lentiform nucleus and matches with B. The clostrum is located medial to the insular cortex, four, and the insular cortex here, four, matches with I in the coronal section. Note that in the coronal section, the insula is the part of the cortex that is hidden, being located in the depth of the lateral sulcus, indicated here as J. Match the following statements with the lettered labels. This is a section of the caudal part of the medulla oblongata at the level of sensory decussation. One is the medially located nucleus gracilis. The neurons in this nucleus give rise to axons that comprise the internal arcuate fibers. You can see them here as interrupted blue lines. They arch medially and ventrally to cross the midline in the sensory decussation and then ascend up as the medial lemniscus. These fibers, they terminate on the ventral posterior lateral nucleus of the thalamus. Thus one matches with D, origin of fibers that terminate in the ventral posterior lateral nucleus of the thalamus. Lateral to nucleus gracilis is the nucleus cuneatus and lateral to it is number two which is the lateral cuneate nucleus, also known as accessory cuneate nucleus. This accessory cuneate nucleus is the source of fibers to the cerebellum, known as cuneocerebellar fibers. They convey proprioceptive information derived from the upper limb to the cerebellum. It is functionally analogous to the nucleus dorsalis of the spinal cord, Clark's column. Cerebellar afferents 
form two types of fibers, mossy fibers and climbing fibers. The climbing fibers, they originate in the inferior olivary complex of nuclei. Cerebellar afferents from other sources end as mossy fibers. And these fibers, they synapse with neurons in the granular layer of the cerebellar cortex. Thus, the accessory cuneate nucleus is one of the nuclei that provide fibers of the mossy type, mossy fibers. And two matches with B, origin of mossy fibers to the cerebellum. Three is the spinal nucleus of the trigeminal nerve. This consists of sensory neurons that mediate pain and temperature sensations from the head. The nucleus is comparable to nucleus proprius in the dorsal horn of the spinal cord. However, the spinal nucleus of the trigeminal nerve projects to the ventral posterior medial nucleus of the thalamus, so it matches with C. On the other hand, the fibers of nucleus proprius, which form the spinothalamic tracts, terminate in the ventral posterior lateral nucleus of the thalamus, together with the dorsal column medial lemniscus system. 4. Is part of the inferior olivary complex, which includes three nuclei. The large principal olivary nucleus, which is not shown here in this section, it's the crumpled bag-shaped nucleus seen in the open part of the medulla at a little bit higher level. The other nuclei are the small dorsal accessory nucleus and the medial accessory olivary nucleus. Nucleus 4 here is the medial accessory olivary nucleus. The olivary complex receive fibers from spinal, brainstem, cerebellar, and cerebral cortices and give rise to olivocerebellar fibers. These olivocerebellar fibers, they cross the midline and they enter the cerebellum via the inferior cerebellar peduncle. These fibers are climbing fibers. They synapse with dendritic tree of Purkinje cells in the molecular layer of the cerebellar cortex. So four matches with A, origin of climbing fibers to the cerebellum. This is a section of the open part of the medulla, which is the upper part, the part that does not contain a central canal, but in which the canal opens to form the floor of the lower part of the fourth ventricle. Also note the crumpled back shape of the large principal olivary nucleus that characterizes the upper part of the medulla. B is the most medially located nucleus in the floor of the lower part of the fourth ventricle. It is the hypoglossal nucleus. It is the origin of fibers that innervate the muscles of the tongue. The extrinsic and intrinsic muscles of the tongue are formed by migration of occipital somites mesoderm and not from pharyngeal arches. They are supplied by general somatic efferent fibers. So B matches with one. Efferent nerves that provide motor innervation to the muscles of the pharyngeal arches are referred to as special visceral efferent fibers, such as those that supply the muscles of facial expression, those that supply the pharyngeal muscles, laryngeal muscles, those are special visceral efferent fibers. A is located lateral to the hypoglossal nucleus and medial to the tractus solitarius. A is thus the dorsal motor nucleus of the vagus. It forms the vagal trigon in the lower part of the floor of the fourth ventricle. It consists of parasympathetic preganglionic neurons which innervate the viscera of the thorax, abdomen, via the vagus nerve. The term general visceral efferent fibers is used to refer to the efferent neurons of the autonomic nervous system that provide motor innervation to the smooth muscle, cardiac muscle, and glands. Thus A, the dorsal nucleus of the vagus, matches with two general visceral efferent nucleus. In the following MRI sections, mark the numbered structures in the axial section with the lettered structures in the sagittal section. Each lettered structure may be used once 
or not at all. One represents the region of the forceps minor. These are the commissural fibers of the corpus callosum located anteriorly. They are the ones that in a sagittal section are referred to as the genome of the corpus callosum. Remember that the corpus callosum is formed by a rostrum, geno, body, and splenium. Two is the septum pellucidum, extending between the fornix three and the corpus callosum one. It forms the medial wall of the lateral ventricle, and it corresponds to G. As you can see here, G in the sagittal section extends between the corpus callosum, F and A, and the fornix in B. So returning back to the axial section, 3, the fornix, corresponds to B in the sagittal section. 4 is the thalamus and is seen here in the axial section on either side of the midline cavity of the third ventricle. In the sagittal section, it corresponds to D. The thalamus is located below the fornix. Which cranial nerve fibers are decussating at this location? This is the rostral part of the pons, showing the fibers of the trochlear nerve in A. The fibers arise from the motor nucleus located in the ventral part of the periaqueductal gray matter at the level of the inferior colliculus, which is just above the level of this section. This is rostral pons. The fibers of the trochlear nerve have an unusual course. This is the only nerve to emerge from the dorsum of the brainstem. Small bundles of fibers, they curve around the periaqueductal gray matter with a caudal slope. That's why they can be seen at the level of the rostral pons. That's to say, just inferior to the inferior colliculus. They decussate in the superior medullary velum and the slender nerve emerges immediately caudal to the inferior colliculus. B, what is the source of afferent fibers to these nuclei? B represent the pontine nuclei located in the basilar part of the pons in between the longitudinally running fibers. They receive ipsilateral corticopontine fibers. These fibers arise from widespread areas in the cerebral cortex, that's why they are called cortico. They occupy the medial and lateral ends of the crust cerebri of the midbrain on either side of the corticospinal and corticobulbar fibers, and then they reach the basilar part of the pons here, where they relay on the pontine nuclei in B. Projections from the pontine nuclei, they will form the transversely running pontocerebellar fibers that cross the midline to reach the cerebellum via the middle cerebellar peduncles. The pontocerebellum ensures a smooth and orderly sequence of muscle contraction of voluntary movements. Damage results in ataxia and dysmetria. For example, when the patient reaches out with the finger to an object, the finger overshoots the mark or deviates from it.